things that it seems to be doing are part of this inheritance that God has given us. That in 2 Peter chapter 1, having granted us that which we need for both life and godliness, we then understand that, that God has made the provision, but we have to make the application of those things to our lives. given us everything that we need so that as Christ said in John's gospel, you might have life and have it more abundantly. So he's given us everything that we need for life. And the Greek word there is the word zoe, zoe. And we understand that that is the abundant life that comes to us in Christ. And so you and I have been equipped and prepared called us to do. And then he has made godliness available to us. Thank you, Chad. He's made godliness available to us as well. And so we understand that he has given us
Stating that in this sort of way, that we are uh, uh, you having to listen to me for a whole hour on Sunday mornings here, because I, I don't get any pride out of doing that. I know that's what needs to be done in the midst of what we're doing these days, but I am not really comfortable with that because I want us all to be able to participate and do those things that we need to do, and yet we're not able to do what I would really like to do in the midst of this because of what's going on. So I just wanted to say to you that uh, I am so very grateful that you have been willing to stay with us. You know, I think the thing that I miss as much as anything that goes on within the context of this is our ability to sing and praise God and do those kinds of things. I mean, I miss that, and I know you do as well. And I think there's a day coming, I don't know how quickly it'll be, but I think there's a day coming when we'll be able to uh, do those things again. And um, we just need to be patient, and we just need to be willing to, uh, to wait on the Lord in the midst of that and, um, and see when we're able to do that in a manner that will be pleasing unto God. So uh, I've said all that to say thank you for uh, continuing to be a part of Freedom Church. I know it's hard for you. I know that uh, we are relational people and we want to get together with uh, brothers and sisters in Christ and spend time with them, and yet we're not able to do that like we would like to do. So I am uh, incredibly grateful that you have been faithful in the midst of this, and I encourage you to continue to be faithful in this, and God will be honored and he will be glorified, and we will come out on the other side of this praising Him and living for Him unlike anything that we've ever done before. So uh, I say those things to you as a word of encouragement in the midst of these uh, days of difficulty and hardship and ask uh, that you would continue to, uh, to walk with us 
in the midst of this. If you have your Bible this morning, I want us to go back to Ephesians chapter 1. Last week, we began to look at this passage found in Ephesians chapter 1, verses 15 through verse 23. And we worked our way through the first several verses there in Ephesians 1, beginning in verse 15. We made our way to verse 19 last Sunday morning. And then as we began to conclude the message last Sunday morning, we began to look at those grace gifts, those blessings in Christ that God has given us in that glorious passage that begins in verse 3 and runs through verse 14. And so I talk to you just briefly about those first two blessings there in verse 4 that we had received. And so we talked about having been chosen. We were chosen by God. And not only did he choose us, but that he prepared us for a work of service in his kingdom and in his body, the church. Verse 4 also talks about our being holy and blameless before him in love. And so in his grace, in his mercy, he has made us holy. He has set us apart for his own work so that through us we might make a difference in our community and in our world. So he has separated us from the world. But there's certainly a difference between he who we serve and those who they serve in the world, recognizing that within the context of the world in which you and I live, there is a world system that is absolutely contrary to Almighty God. And God has allowed that world system to continue to function so that there would be such a distinction between the body of Christ as she lives out the life of the Lord Jesus in the context of the church in the world today that those who are outside of the body of Christ cannot help but see that there is something significantly different about us. And so we are holy and without blame before him in love. And we have begun to understand that love in verse 4 as it talks to us about us receiving that love and that love becoming a part of us and that love flowing out of us.
this day, just as 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 3 declares to us that uh, he, by his divine power, by the Holy Spirit, he has given us everything that we need to live life on planet Earth and to function in godliness within the context of this life. So verse 5 talks about us being adopted. Verse 6 declares to us that we have been accepted in the beloved. That not only were we adopted and become members of the family of God, but we have been accepted in the beloved. That God so loved us that he sent his son to die on Calvary's cross so that through that precious blood that was shed for us on Calvary, we might then become members of the family of God when that blood is applied to our lives. And that not only do we become adopted members of the family, we become accepted by God into that family. Do you know what that means? That if you and I have been accepted by God into the blood, into that family, and God declares that we are accepted as Paul shares with us under the inspiration of God's Holy Spirit here in this verse, then that means that we are persons of worth. That means that we are people that God believes in. We are people who have been entrusted with the message of Christ to make a difference in our world. things need to happen. First and foremost of all, we need to accept ourselves. And that there needs to be a self-acceptance that we have toward ourselves. So that we can then do the second part of that, which is that we can accept others as beloved. And that we can not only see ourselves as see others as being persons of worth as well. So verse 6 talks about us being accepted uh, in the beloved. It says, to the praise of the glory of his grace by which he has made us accepted in the beloved. Verse 7 talks about redemption. And what it says, in him, that is in Christ, we have redemption. He has redeemed us. He has made redemption available through his blood. And the outcome of that was the forgiveness of our sins. So he has made redemption available to us. And within the context of that redemption, our sins have been forgiven according to the riches of his grace. It is impossible for us to get our head It is beyond our comprehension. How could God love me this way? How could God care for me when I was a sinner? And yet we understand that, that by His grace, by His divine favor, He has made redemption available to us. Look what else it says here. Verse 8, the grace abounds, which he has made, the riches of his grace, the end of verse 7, which he made to abound toward us in all wisdom and prudence. So we have received the wisdom of God by way of his grace as well. And then verse 9, having made known unto us the mystery of his will, that God Through the Lord Jesus Christ, that both Jews and 
Gentiles become one body, the church in Christ. And then we would see as well that we would understand the mystery of his will. And in the context of that mystery, we would understand as well that he has a will for us as individuals. And a will for us as a body who is in this state of will. Verse 11 says to us that um, that he may know that the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure which he purposed in himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of time he might gather together in one all things in Christ. And what we know is that at the end of time he's going to gather together everything in one in Christ. And so he shares with us this idea of the hope that is what else this passage declares to us. That in him we have obtained an inheritance being predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will. What we who first trusted in Christ that we should be to the praise of the glory of his grace. In him you also trusted after hearing the word of truth. And so there was the hearing of the word of in your life and in mine that caused us to trust in the gospel of your salvation in whom also you believe in whom you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession and you and I are purchased possessions for God that we were purchased with the precious blood of the Lord Jesus and he gave us, as a down payment on that inheritance, the third person of the Godhead, the Holy Spirit, to abide within us. So that through the abiding of God's Holy Spirit, we might be equipped. We might be prepared. We might be able to do what he has called us to do in these days as his so this goes on to say, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of that purchased possession to the praise of his glory. And then in verse 18 it declares that we might know the hope of his calling. That his calling to us provides for us the beginning of an of this hope that we have in Christ. And what we see in the hope of that calling is that he has chosen by a definitive act of his will to use us in this redemptive process. That because he has called us and we are now witnesses of him, because we've had an experience with him, we are able to Share with others that which he has done for us so that they might recognize something significant has happened to us. And we desire for that something significant to happen to others as well. And so we have this hope of our calling in Christ. Look what else this says to us. We, in, in verse 18, that we might have the hope of his calling, one of the riches and glories of the inheritance of the saints, and what is the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe, according to the working of his mighty power. Now, I am convinced that we do not understand the dynamics of the Spirit's power that is in operation within each of us. And that God wants to do both in us and through us, keeping us abundantly above anything that we ever asked or thought. So let me go back to uh, verse 15 and read this passage to us. 
And then I want to draw your attention to verse 20. And there in verse 20, we will begin to look at this passage in detail. Therefore, Paul says, I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints, do not cease to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayer. Paul says, I'm praying for you. I've seen how you operate. I've heard what's going on there. And I am praying for you, Paul is saying. Verse 17, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. According to the working of his mighty power. The word power there is the word dunamis. We get our word dynamite from that. And so he's talking about something that is incredibly powerful. Something that can make a difference in your life and in my life. That's what I should say. Page 20. If he works in Christ. Above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And he put all things under his, that's Christ's feet, and gave him Christ to be head over all things to the church, which is his body. The fullness of him who fills all in all. And so we understand that we have been filled with the power of God. And that the power that resides within us is the same power that raised Jesus from the dead. And so according to the work of his mighty power, there at the end of verse 19, we would understand that he has given us that power so that we can expect Something of that power in operation in our lives. So according to his working, that according there would carry with it the idea of our expectation of that power. So basically what he's saying here is that if we expect very little, we will receive very little power. But if we expect great power to do great things for God, then we will see great power in operation within the context of our lives and within the context of the body of Christ. I am not a secessionist. I don't believe when the last apostle died that the power of God quit working. And in that sense, what we would then say is that when John, the apostle, died sometime after A.D. 100, and we know historically, uh, and according to 1 John, that he was very feeble when he wrote 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. Most scholars believe he was pastored then at, at the church at Ephesus, and that they he was unable to walk any longer, and they would carry him in and lay him in front of the congregation, and he would preach in a prone position. And so when he died, the secessionists would say, God stopped working or doing those things that he did in the context of the first century. So one day, before John died, the church at Ephesus 
There is working in great power in the context of the Holy Spirit. John dies the next day. They're unable to work in that power. That just doesn't seem to make sense to me as it relates to how God operates and functions. So what we need to understand is that Hebrews 13 tells us that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And that same power that raised Jesus from the dead abides in you and me and that he wants to do through us as Freedom's Church exceedingly abundantly above anything that we ever asked or thought. And that he wants to use us in such a way that we are making a dynamic difference in our community. And that the world and the world where we've been planted is able to see Jesus in us. Because we're following him. Because we're operating by faith in him. Because we believe him. Because we believe that he's provided redemption for us. And those things that he's called on us to understand, to know, and to do. We are now able to do them because of who he is in us. And so this passage tells us that he is working in his mighty power or with the strength of his might in us to perform those things that he wants to accomplish so that he might receive all the So verse 20 now tells us, look at what the word of God says, which he worked in Christ, this mighty power, when he raised him from the dead. And then not only did he raise him from the dead, but you will remember that on the cross, Jesus declared that it is finished. And when he made that declaration, that the veil in the temple, the veil between the holy place and the most holy place, which was something that was sewn together that was at least four inches thick. It was about this thick. And that the Bible declares to us that when Jesus declared that his work on Calvary was finished, that the veil in the temple was rent in two from the top to the bottom, signifying for us that man now has direct access into the very presence of God because of the work of the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. And so when we read this, we recognize that God raised him from the dead. And then it says that he seated him at his right hand. That God seated Christ at God's right hand in the heavenly places. And we know that the picture of, of that being seated on the right hand was the place of honor and the place of importance. And so we recognize that in the eyes of God, that that which Jesus did for us on Calvary is of utmost importance. And that he seated him to indicate to us that he had completed that work that he had been called to do. And he sat down next to God the Father. And we know there's a day coming when God is going to say to his son, Son, go get my children and bring them. So this word tells us and gives, it gave the uh, Ephesian church encouragement and ought to give you and me encouragement today as well to recognize that before the foundation of the world, God had a plan. And not only did God have a plan then, he's got a plan today. 
And he's got a plan for you and for me individually. And he's got a plan for us as it relates to Freedom Church. And he's got a plan for Taylor County and Campbellsville. And he wants to use us in the midst of that plan to make a difference in the lives of those around about us so that they can come to be members of the family of God and that we can then share the gospel to a greater extent as we move forward in faith, seeing others come to know Christ as their personal Lord and Savior. Well, look what he says in verse 21. That he seated him in the heavenly places far above all principality and power and might and dominion. And every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in that which is to come. Now you recognize today that the enemy is the prince of the power of the air. And that within the context of him being the prince of the power of the air, the word here in verse 21 talks about far above all principality and that evil spirits function in some kind of hierarchical order based upon what that word principalities translates in the Greek. And so we understand then that this word tells us that there are various orders of evil spirits. And that within the context of that, you and I need to understand. And oh, by the way, that is why he tells us over in Ephesians chapter 6 that we are to take on the whole armor of God. And that within the context of the evil spirits who are here on planet Earth, you and I need to be equipped and need to be prepared so that when the enemy comes against us, we are able to fight against the enemy in the power of God's Holy Spirit so that the enemy does not overcome us. And so this word carries with it the idea of the manner in which evil spirits function in our world. Then look what else it says about them here. It says that not only they are far above all principalities and power and might and dominion. And so we know that evil spirits have dominion on this earth. And we recognize that within the context of that dominion, that is where they operate. But also they seek to usurp the dominion that is given to man so that they might be able to operate more freely on this earth. And so God has allowed them a certain measure of freedom so that they are able to do what they do on this earth. But they have sought to usurp our dominion as believers in Christ and as those who have been given dominion if we go back all the way to Genesis chapter 3 we recognize that God has given mankind dominion over planet Earth and that the enemy has sought to usurp that power over this Earth above that which God has given us. And that we have given over to the enemy far more than he deserves to have and we have allowed him to take from us those things that God never intended him to take. And that we have just acted as if there's nothing we can do about that. Which is not the case at all. And so Paul is declaring to us here in this passage. Remember, he's talked about us receiving that dominant power. He's talking about the Holy Spirit who resides with us, within us. He's talking about us being given that power so that we might exercise that power on this earth. And then he talks about the power of the earth and how it is limited. And look what he says. Far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in that which is to come. So there never has been 
and there never will be a time when God will not be in control and that he has not given, sent, and through the Lord Jesus Christ the domination that he and the name that he has thrown all to operate in. So, So Jesus now has been given all power and all authority over all things. Everything is under his feet. Now, why would Paul say that? What was Paul's purpose in making that declaration? Well, remember that Colossians declares to us that Jesus is the head of the body of And that if the church is the body of Christ, then we are above those things as well. That he has made us to be overcomers. And so the question becomes, are we operating in a manner whereby we are so living in him that we are overcoming as well? What was that said? And he put all things individually and corporately as the body of Christ having been planted on the Lord my heart and from his will is to be done under Christ's direction and under Christ's headship. He is our Lord. He is our steward. He is our master. He is the one who makes the decisions. So that he is glorified in us, the body of Christ, the his church. Then look what it says, verse 24. He is head over all things for the church, which is his body. Now, now look at the last phrase there. The fullness of him who fills all in all. What he's saying there. of Christ on the earth. That if in fact we are the fullness of Christ on the earth, then we are 
the representation of Christ, would we not be? Would not his fullness emphasize to us that we are his representation? And if, in fact, we are his representatives, and we are to represent him on this earth, then it goes back to what we, what we talked about earlier in this message, that we need to understand that we have been called by God, adopted by God, chosen by God, so that we might, through that inheritance, be able to do the work that he's called us to do. Now, here's the problem we've got. The average Southern Baptist spends less than two minutes a day in prayer. And what's even more shocking than that is that the average Southern Baptist pastor spends less than six minutes a day in prayer. And the truth is, And what's happened to us is that we have become so busy and doing so many other things that those other things have taken over our lives. And that they are keeping us from spending time each day doing the thing and his So, what that means is that we've got to have our priorities right. And that somewhere along the line, our priorities got really mixed up. And that the things of the world have become priority for us. And because we have made those things as Lord, our priorities become So what happens then is that the longer that they have, the further and further away from God we become. And as I said to you last Sunday, I believe that the, 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 this COVID thing is a cage rattling situation for the body of Christ. It's a remind us how important relationships are. It's a remind us. when we don't have each other as we need. And that God wants to use us as instruments of his gospel and his church and in the church. And I believe, just as Terry and I have said on the screen this morning, that if we as children of God don't do what God has called us to do. We'll find big people to represent and big things and our ability to do what he wants them to do and they'll do it and he will move us out of the way to become a master of their life as he's looking to do for you this particular day at this particular time. So here's what that, that means that we start to see things in priority. That means we that we know better than God. We can't decide that we know more than God. And we would never say that. I understand that. But what happens is, what we do is that we live our lives in such a way that we act as if we're smarter than God. We act as if we're able to do things without God. So this morning, as we come to a time of invitation, 
Here's what I would ask of you today. That, that as we move our way through this invitation, you just begin to pray. You just begin to ask God to begin to reveal to you that which you need to understand about what kind of priority God is in your life today. See, folks, if he's not Lord of all in your life, he's not Lord of all in your life. And you desperately in this day need God. And you desperately in this day need God. And so only as we reorient ourselves to that, only as we move ourselves under the Holy Spirit's assessment of our life, as we move ourselves back to that place where he is in charge of all of our lives, we will begin to begin to make a difference in our community. So as I pray, as we begin to move our way through this invitation, as if you would ask God, Holy Spirit, to reveal to you where God is in that hour of your life. Who's our dwell there? Who's our dwell?